Today on Dr. Phil, is it possible for a woman to violate a man? Were you negligent? He did tell me to stop. He claims his former girlfriend. I kept trying to fight her off. I couldn't get away. Sexually assaulted him. He said you used one arm to pin him down, the other one to unzip his pants. I didn't force myself on him. Chris is on the phone, so you're okay with her becoming a registered sex offender and going to the penitentiary. For all the things that I went through, yes. Let's do it. If we're going to do something here that matters, then we got to deal with the truth. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. If I can help get this family back on track, are you willing to do that? Ready, free. Take. This is going to be a changing day in your life. Well, now I'm going to tell you, you may have heard about my guests today, but they say they wish you hadn't heard of them. In our first story, it's not every day you hear about a man being raped by a woman. But Chris claims his ex-girlfriend, Jessica, raped him and got pregnant in the process. Take a look. A young father claims he was raped by an old girlfriend, and he doesn't think he should have to pay child support. She climbed into my lap, and I said, what are you doing? She said, well, you know you want me. I said, no, I don't. Chris claims he was raped by his old girlfriend, Jessica Fuller. A guy not wanting to have sex with somebody, that seems impossible. Chris says one night, in the backseat of a friend's car, it happened. I kept trying to fight her off, fight her off, fight her off, slam the hand over the lock. I tried to get out, I couldn't get away. She got pregnant and had their son, Joshua. Chris was never a part of his son's life. Now the state of Michigan wants Chris to start paying child support. I'm the victim of a crime, why should I have to pay the perpetrator? Well, Jessica says the sex was consensual, and Chris never mentioned rape until he was faced with having to pay child support. When Chris and I first started dating, we were both 14. When it came to contraception, we didn't use anything. We were together for about three years before I had gotten pregnant. He claimed that I got pregnant because I raped him. Chris never had to fight me off. He never had to tell me stop in any way. Neither one of us ever said no. It was in a hospital when I told Chris that I was pregnant. And he said, I can't believe this. And he stormed out of the room and he screamed at his mother in the hallway and said, she's pregnant again. And he left me there. I never asked Chris for child support. Um, I told him that I had to fill out papers for it. And he denied that it was even his son. I learned that Chris <sighs> claimed that I raped him through a reporter. I was stunned. I would never think that somebody would ever use something as serious as being raped to try to use it for their own personal gain just so they don't have to send a check every month. OK, Jessica is here with me. Chris is on the phone listening. And I'm going to be talking with him uh, in a bit. But we heard his tape piece first, your second. So I'm going to talk to you first and then him second because I want to keep everything balanced here. Do you say you did not rape him because you just think the concept of a woman raping a guy is just not credible, that that just, that just doesn't happen? No, absolutely not. I know it can happen. You know, anything is, you know, definitely possible. Anybody can be raped. I say it didn't happen because there's no... I did not force myself. It was 100% you know, we both agreed to it 100%. Mm -hmm. You know, whether a child came out of it or not, you know, shouldn't have any bearing on what he has with his son, what kind of relationship he has with Joshua. Okay, but you have said some things to us and to other media along the way that I've put together that with my understanding of the definition of rape and consensual, sound very close to you fitting the definition. And I'd, I'm not saying that was your mindset, not saying that was your intent, right. but I'm trying to find out what was really going on here. Now, you guys have dated on and off for like three years, right? Yes. And I, I think Chris said that you guys have broken up like 25 times. Yeah. So this has been on again, off again. Yes. And so you were actually breaking up this night Yes, I broke up with him early that morning. 
but yet you're having sex with him. We did. In the back of the car that we night. We did have sex that night. And way. you said that you initiated the sex. No, it, it wasn't initiate. I, to be honest, I really don't remember who initiated what. I just remember us making out on a, it's kind of like a, like a balcony thing. You can go, you know, up the stairs, look over the water, and that's where it started. Uh huh. But that's not where it ended. No, that's not where it ended. Where did it end? It ended in my friend's car. In the back seat of the car? Yes. Okay. And the first time you had sex, it was in the back seat of the car? Yes, in the back seat of his car. Yeah. You ever heard that old saying, get a room? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, you, you haven't been charged with any crime here, so you're no. not facing any criminal uh, nope. responsibility here. But you had gotten pregnant earlier that year. Yes, I did. And you had a miscarriage. Yes. Sorry for your loss on that. I'm sorry that happened to you. And this was a couple of months later, right? It was a month later when I had conceived again. Okay. And your doctor had said that post miscarriage mm -hmm. that you would be extremely fertile. Right. Right? That there's high risk here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you had sex with him. You're in charge of your body. He's in charge of his. That's Correct. my view. Okay. Now, you're in charge of your body. Did you want to get pregnant? No, I did not did want to get pregnant. Did you want to have a baby with the boy you broke up with that morning? No. Then why are you having sex with him in the back seat of a car that night with no birth control whatsoever? To be honest, I don't know. I well, wasn't thinking. No, I, wasn't I don't thinking. know is an answer. You, 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 you had no birth You were taking no birth control. No, I was not. He, you, he had no condom. No. You didn't even make an effort to control it. So this is what I'm trying to get to. You get in the back seat with, with this guy, and you get on top of him, right? Mm -hmm. You said you crawled on top of him. Yeah, yep. OK. And you knew you had a, a medical professional tell you you are extremely fertile, you have no birth control whatsoever, and you consciously, willfully, purposefully have sex with this guy. Yes. Did you fail to take proper care against getting pregnant? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so you were definitely negligent. Yes. Okay, and so when, when you got on top of him, was he aware that you were yes. highly fertile? Yes, he was. And he was there did, in the did he ever at any point say, stop? He yeah. did tell me to stop. He did. He okay. said, whoa, hold on a second. Okay, so, so he did say, stop, hold on, wait a minute. Yes. And, and then... You, you wound up finishing anyway. Yep, yep. Because he said that, wait a minute, hold on, I, I'm, I want out of here. I don't, no, no, this is not a good idea. Don't want to no. do this. Don't want to be a dad. Don't want to get pregnant. Not ready for that. He reached for the door and he says, you reach over and slam the lock down. No. Put your hand on the lock and said, no. and, and so the door didn't work. No. That didn't happen. No. Okay. No, he was very much stronger than I was. Mm -hmm. Well, but you were on top of him. Yes, but he was, there was enough room in the vehicle for him to push me off. There was enough room for him to get away, if that were the case. He said you used one arm to pin him down, the other one to unzip his pants while you were sitting on top wow. of him. Wow. I sound pretty crafty. <laughs> no, that never well, happened. Well, you know, I'm just asking, I, I'm just asking because it, it seems to me like you were being pretty reckless that night. We've just, I we, was, yes. We've agreed that you were reckless, that you were negligent. Yes. And the question is, did you coerce, no, which I, would I equate to, to rape? I definitely, you know, made some bad choices that night. You know, everybody's done it. But that night was not, I didn't physically force myself on him. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not that dominating. I'm just, I'm not. I did not do that. If he would have right. said, no, get off, I want out, I would have gotten off and he would have gotten out. Now, you said he never brought this up until you filed for child support. Yes. But he says that he, in fact, contacted the sheriff's office a few weeks afterwards. Why wasn't I arrested? Why wasn't I ever spoken to? I never had anything until a few months ago when I heard about it in an article when a reporter called me. Quick poll in the audience. If you think it's possible for a woman to rape a man, raise your hand. That's almost everybody. If you think, no, don't get it, not possible, raise your hand. That's a few think, no, not possible. So most people think that, that it is, a, at least conceptually, mm -hmm. a possibility. All right, we have to take a break. 
And I want to hear what Chris has to say about this. We'll be right back. After I told Chris that the state was requiring me to go after for child support, he called me names like, you nasty bitch, you whore. He's not mine, you slut, you slept around. And I'll just tell everybody that it was statutory rape. I won't have to pay a thing. I'm the victim of a crime. Why should I have to pay the perpetrator? I just, I never thought that he would have went that low. Well, that was Jessica talking about her ex-boyfriend Chris's reaction when she told him that he had to pay child support. Now, Jessica's here today because she wants people to know that she is not a rapist. And so your point is, if somebody gets on the Internet and searches you up, bang, your name comes up associated with having raped someone. Correct. And so you're saying, I, I hate that. I, I don't want that to be the case. Now, Chris is on the phone, and he does not want to interact with you at this point. It's fine. So he's been listening to you, and you can listen to him. But if you will... You step to the side here conversationally and let me talk to Chris, and if he wants to say something to you, that's up to him. Uh, he can, but I told Chris it would just be he and I talking. Chris, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Have you been listening so far? Yes, I have. And what do you agree or disagree with that has been said? Well, I disagree with the fact that she wanted to get pregnant because that was very obvious to everybody. It seemed to be except for me. I mean, I had people telling me all the time that that's all that she wanted, and I kind of looked over it. I mean, she was the first girlfriend I'd ever had, and I put a lot of trust into her, even though, you know, there was a lot of heartache on my part. I mean, she broke up with me constantly to be with other guys. So, you know, um, also, uh, not that it's a major thing, but um, I was 15 and she was 16. She was almost 16 when we met. Mm -hmm. um, there was never a conversation about finishing during what happened to me either there so was never anything like that i said i didn't want to i didn't want to be there i didn't want to do that and the only coercion there was was her saying you know you want to continue you know you, you want you know you want to keep going and i didn't you know mm -hmm. i didn't want to be a dad i did want to get out of the car and there was not enough room to push her off because her back was against the passenger seat that was leaned back i couldn't get out okay now at, at this point so you're saying that this is Jessica is the first girl that you had sex with yes. at 15 years of age. Yes. And you had gotten, the two of you had gotten pregnant before. Was that your child? See, that's the thing. I don't know because she also had a sexual relationship with other guys as well in between um, her relationship with me. Uh huh. Now, is it your understanding that she had sex with you that night in the car and if it was rape, that's not sex, that's rape. Those are two very different things. Absolutely. But f for the purposes of this conversation, she had this interaction with you that night in the car, and then she went somewhere after you yes. and had, had sexual relations with someone else. Mere hour, just hours later. Okay. Do you know that this baby in question is yours? Uh, there was a paternity test done. Okay, so it definitely is yours. Okay, so I wanted to clear yes. that up. Now. When you guys got out of the car, and you did get out of the car after this, correct? Yes. Were you asking her to come home with you? No, no, not at all. We got back into the car. Uh, well, our, our friends came back from the beach because that's where they were. They were down on the beach when this occurred. Mm -hmm. And um, in the time in waiting, I got out of the car. I sat on the back of the car with my head in my hands. I didn't speak to anyone. They came back. We got back in the car. They took me home and dropped me off. Did you feel violated, or were you afraid that you had just gotten her pregnant because you knew she was high risk at that point? No, I did feel violated because throughout our relationship, we had a, a consensual relationship prior to this. And, you know, it seems like as soon as she got the miscarriage is when she got even more aggressive. I mean, she was always aggressive to begin with in our relationship, but it seems like this is where she took it to a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. Did you guys ever live together after this incident? Um, yes, because um, she didn't have anywhere else to go at the time, and my mother took her, and I hadn't told anybody at this point what had happened. I, I just wanted to block it out. Well, isn't it kind of odd that you would move your rapist into your home? Well, they see, that wasn't my, my decision necessarily. That was more um, my, my mother's, because she was living with us before this happened, um, because her family had left her at the hospital when she had that miscarriage. So she moved in with us after the fact, and she moved out just about a day before this happened 
and she had nowhere else to go after that and my my mother took her back and like I said you know after it happened I didn't really know how to respond I just I I, I wanted to block it out I wanted to pretend like it never happened did you ever have sexual relations after the night in question no with her you never had sex again no Jessica says that you were together for three months uh, uh, two. After, after this happened. Yeah, there was two months. Two months. She was living here with, you know, because she had nowhere else to go. Uh huh. So did you get along? Uh, <laughs> there, were, there were times where things were okay, but for the most part, no. Okay. Is rape too strong a word here? Um, was this something that you have some ownership in, no ownership in? Is rape too strong a word to use here? No, I don't think it is. Because I did, in fact, tell her no. I tried to get away from her, and I couldn't get away. I mean, I had no choice but to give up after fighting it for at least 10, 15 minutes. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get away. Well, I have to ask the, the question that's on everybody's mind, because you're, we're looking at a picture of you right now. You look to be a, a very nice-looking, clean-cut, uh, young man, you look to be very healthy and, and strong. Um, I, I think people, it would beg the question, were you not able to overpower her, defend her, turn away from her, rotate your body to one side, do something to avoid this having happened? What you see now is a product of a lot of hard work to get myself back into shape because when this happened I really was not a very big guy. I was about 150 pounds if that. I wasn't very strong. I never lifted a weight in my life until just only less than two or three years ago. Um, I was not a strong guy and after the fact of everything that happened I blew up in weight. I gained about 70 pounds just from sheer depression and, and, and you know I fed my I basically fed my feelings. Um, I blew up, and it's not until about 2009 that I finally started to lose weight and get control of my health and my own weight again. And I feel now that I have to go to the gym to maintain some kind of strength. I, I don't know if it's something that's subconscious because of what happened, but you know, that's just how I am now. Mm -hmm. Do your parents believe that you were raped? Yes, yes, absolutely. As uh, a matter of fact, she admitted in our living room in front of my parents that she had said, you know, that I had said no during this whole thing and that I tried to get away. We'll be right back. Now, you understand that rape is a felony, right? Absolutely, yes. And that if she is convicted of rape, um, I mean, if someone said, okay, you know, we're, we're going to start drilling down on this, figure out that she, that she raped this young man. Uh, that's a felony. Uh, she could wind up being a registered sex offender and do any number of years uh, in the state penitentiary for a felony. Yes. Is, is, that, is that your hope and intent here? Honestly, for what happened to me, yes. Okay. Um, so, so you're okay with her becoming a registered sex offender and going to the penitentiary? For all the things that I went through and the psychological damage that I went through, yes. Mm -hmm. I know that there's other guys that she's been in relationships with that were very, she was very aggressive in um, that I've spoken to. So I know that I'm not the only one who's gone through at least the aggressive part of her. I just think I caught the extreme. Okay. And what is your son's name? Uh, Joshua. And how is your relationship with him? I've never, I mean, I, I've, I think I met him one time when he was an infant, but I've never had any interaction with him. But you, you understand he is your biological child, even though you believe he was a product of rape. Yes, and that's okay. why it's been such a, a difficult thing to cope with. You know, a lot of people say to me, how can you not be a part of, of, of this child's life? But the thing is, is that, yes, he's an innocent child, but I'm also innocent as well. Yeah, but we can agree he's done absolutely nothing wrong. Oh, absolutely. Okay, and, and if his mother goes to the penitentiary uh, and becomes a registered sex offender, then what will happen to the child? See, that's where I'm, that's where I'm not sure because I know that 
with everything that happened, I'm not a unbiased person with him. You know, I don't think that it would be fair for him to grow up with a father who who went through what he did, and, and you know that now he is a product of, of this rape. This happened in um, was this in January of '06? Uh, this happened. Uh, the exact date is. Uh, I don't really remember the exact date. It was it was either the it was towards the very end of 2005 or the very beginning of 2006. Okay, and you did not level these rape allegations until 09. Um, well, officially, yeah, in the courtrooms, yes, that's when it got out that way. But no, I had been talking to people, and, and everybody knew what happened. You know, only sh a few short months after it did happen. Uh huh. And, of course, her position, and I'll let you respond to this, her position is that your allegation of rape coincided with her move to get child support from you and that the one defense against liability for child support is that this was non-consensual and so you didn't willingly participate in the making of this child. Yeah, that, that, is, that, is, that is an absolutely false statement. Well, I, no, that's not false as to the law. No, not to you're, the law, no. no you're no. saying it's false as this. That's why you brought it forward. Exactly. I mean, I, I look at it this way. You know, I'm married to a woman who has two children that are not mine, that I'm taking care of, that they don't even get child support. You know, if it was trying to get away from a child, why would I get myself involved in a relationship with two children that aren't mine? Uh -huh. And I understand that you've had a legal setback in that the court has yes. denied your motion to dismiss her claim for child support. Yes. So a court yes. has deemed that the test of the law was not met and that you owe the child support. Yes, and that is what I'm currently paying right now. Okay. Um, if she dropped her claim for child support, would you drop your allegation of rape? I don't, I don't think that I could do that. Okay, I'm not suggesting, I'm just asking. No. Do you feel that I've given you a fair opportunity to state your side of the case? Yes. All right, I'm going to take a break and let you continue listening, and if I have a question, I may come back to you. Okay. Uh, after the break, I'm going to let Jessica respond, and we're going to hear what a witness has to say. Well, some days on the Dr. Phil show we talk about really unusual things and it is unusual for a male to claim that he has been raped by a female. Now I will tell you that if you search the medical and psychological and sociological literature you will find a number of experts that will tell you that this is possible. And you might say well you know how because the man has to be aroused. But the truth is that a man can be aroused uh, involuntarily in some respects, in part due to sexual stimuli, in part due to um, adrenaline, excitement, any number of things. So I think the consensus among experts, at least physiologically, is that this is certainly a possibility. Uh, is it what happened in this case? Uh, that's what we're trying to figure out. Jessica has a witness who was there the night Chris says that he was raped. Now, Kim is joining us on the phone. Kim, what happened that night? Um, well, I'm not sure what happened previous in the day. Um, I do know Chris and Jessica were no longer dating. Um, my boyfriend at the time and I had picked up Jessica and Chris, and we all went to the beach. Um, they had already started making out in the back seat and kind of getting a little into it. So as soon as we parked, my boyfriend and I had gotten out of the vehicle and walked towards the beach. We ended up just sitting on a bench. Well, we had seen them in the back of the car, and we saw their silhouettes, you know, moving in motions and everything. Um, once they had finished, they had gotten out, so we had walked back to the car. Um, every, everything seemed fine. We all got back into the vehicle. Um, we conversed a little, then we kind of split off into our own personal conversations. Um, once we had dropped everybody or dropped Chris off, he got upset. Um, I believe Jessica had said they were talking about her staying the night with him. So he was upset because she didn't want to stay. Well, my boyfriend had dropped us off to my vehicle. Jessica and I drove to her house. 
um, which she rented with a, the boy that we went to school with. Um, they had ended up starting to make out and get into it, so therefore they went off into the room and they had um, sex also that night. And I believe it wasn't until a few weeks after that that nothing became an issue until after Chris had found out about that night. So you think when he found out that she had sex with someone else, he got offended then? Yes. Uh-huh. But that's just conjecture on your part. Yes. Did he seem upset when you returned to the car? Um, not until the end of the car ride when she had told him, no, she didn't want to stay the night at his house. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's when he got upset. He wasn't upset when you got back. Because he said he was sitting on the back of the car holding his head in his hands, and he was upset. Um, he was sitting on the back of the car, but he didn't seem any out of ordinary than just after being exhausted from what he had just done. So you just don't think it happened in this circumstance? I do believe that it didn't happen only because I know a few times we had talked Chris into skipping school, and they've had sex in the back of my car at the beach. Chris, is there anything you'd like to say in response to Kim's comments? Well, I mean, <laughs> for one, the whole um, the whole thing where they were talking, where she was just mentioning about uh, at the end of the conversation, or at the end of the car ride where I got into an argument with her, I never said anything the entire car ride because of how upset that I was. Um, you know, I, I I had nothing to say to anybody. I, I was too upset by what happened. And everything that she is talking about that she says that she thinks happened, well, from the outside, it might have looked that way. But I was truly upset because of what had just happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you want her to stay with you that night? No, absolutely not. Leading up to the instance in the car, is it true that the two of you, you and Jessica, were in fact making out, kissing, hugging, all that sort of thing? No. Well, Jessica says you guys were making out ahead of time before you got there to the beach, and Kim says you were making out before you got to the beach. So I just need to be clear, are both of them lying in your view? Yes. So, Jessica, what's going on here? Hey, it is true, though. I did have sex with another man that night. Um, not proud of it, but I did. And the reason Chris left me was because of that specific reason. He was living with me at my house at the time, um, he had found out I did deny it as much as I could because, you know, I, w I was not proud of that night having sex with two men. Definitely was not proud of that. Mm -hmm. Chris was my first and only, especially when I got pregnant the first time. That night was the very first time I ever had sex with anyone else other well, than Chris. Well, are, are you angry that you're being accused of this? I'm very angry. I mean, rape is a very serious thing. You know, women and men go through it, you know, Unfortunately, you know, every day it happens. But to be associated with something so disgusting, it's very, very sickening when nobody wants to believe you, when everybody takes one side and they don't care what the other side is. Mm -hmm. And when my children find that when they get older, you know, it just, it's sickening to think what could happen because of, you know, him opening his mouth just to, for whatever reason, you know. So what are you guilty of here? I'm probably guilty of not being very responsible. Um, definitely guilty of letting my emotions and feelings of um, him and I get the best of me. Um, definitely guilty of being reckless. Thank you. Um, but the one thing I'm definitely not guilty of is raping him. Do you believe that he believes what he's saying? I do. So you believe that he believes he was raped? Yeah. So you don't think he's just making this up? You think he really is hurt by this? I and, do. And he really believes he was raped? I do. I, I think he really does feel that he probably got taken advantage of that night. I really do. OK. And you agree that you may have initiated, you may have been the aggressor, but you don't think it went anywhere near no, definitely What someone not. would think of as rape. No. And you agree that you were reckless? Yes. That you were negligent? Mm hmm That you were irresponsible? Yes. Not once, but twice that night? Yes. Okay. 
So there's a lot of bad decisions made all the way yeah, around. Yeah, there was. Okay, well, we're going to talk more about this as the show unfolds, and you're going to hear some things about what you can do to help clean up this image that you think can stick with you for a long time in job interviews or whatever if somebody does a search on you and then here this pops up. Okay. Uh, but you have no criminal charges pending at this no. point. No. All right. Okay. We're going to move on. Uh, if you found out your partner was cheating, uh, what would you do? Well, my next guest did something that made international news. An exclusive interview with her next. The Jilted Mistress is getting revenge in a very big way. She's launched a very public campaign against the president of one of the world's largest tech firms. His ex-girlfriend has plastered cities around the country with huge billboards showing them together in happier times. You might remember my next guest, Yovani. Her story made international news. Take a look. From New York to San Francisco, one mistress turns a private breakup into public payback. Yvonne Wilkins is the mistress. Charles Phillips, the head of Oracle Corporation, and married. Wilkins apparently had these billboards put up after Phillips reconciled with his wife. After eight and a half years, I found out that Charles was still married. Because Charles was president of Oracle, it was extremely easy for him to mask his relationship with his wife. He would say to me, I have to go to Europe for five days. I have to go to Asia for four days. His excuses rolled off his tongue. Because of the red flags, I did hire a private investigator. What I found out was that Charles was still living with his wife. I just felt sick to my stomach. Because I wanted everyone to know that I had a significant relationship with Charles. I put the billboards up to tell everyone that I was this man's partner. I didn't put the billboards up to tell everyone I was a mistress. I loved him and I thought he loved me. Now, Yovani says as soon as the billboards went up, her world came crashing down. When the billboards went up, and the media started attacking me, calling me a whore. They were calling me a homewrecker. It backfired, and I felt ashamed. I felt that I couldn't go outside. I couldn't leave my house. It was so hard just to walk my dogs every day. It's been two years since the billboards went up, and I am absolutely concerned that if I meet someone, whether it's a business associate or my next boyfriend. I'm afraid that the first thing they will do is Google me because it's what people do these days. They Google everyone. And all that was up there was Yovani, billboard mistress. Yovani, Charles Phillips' scorned mistress. Yovani, psycho. And I'm none of those things. I'm very smart. I'm very funny. And there's nothing that says that online. Well, Yovani hasn't spoken to any media in two years since everything happened. How is it going for you now? So for the past two and a half years, I've moved on. I've started multiple businesses and um, executive produced a documentary that kind of explains the billboard, how, what led to the billboard fiasco. Mm -hmm. And I've written a memoir. So why talk about it now? I'm ready to tell my story. I wasn't ready when it initially occurred in January of 2010 because I knew that there was no way I can tell this layered, complicated story in a 30-second interview with the various media outlets that were camping outside of my home and my parents' home. Mm -hmm. So why did you put these billboards up? This was my way to say I was significant. I was not a mistress. I, I because you didn't think you were the other woman, and you came to California. You all bought a house together out here? Yes. For like $11 million? Yes. Tell me about the moment when you decided, I'm going to buy billboards in multiple cities and put this up there in like 20 by 60 foot sign. I was 
driving down the highway and I noticed a billboard that his company had put up for their big annual conference in San Francisco. So I just thought if Oracle can put up a billboard, I'm going to put up a billboard. And then I just let it go and moved on until the Tiger Woods issue happened. And I've been having unprotected sex with this man for eight and a half years. And I realized at that moment that, oh my God, I'm a mistress. I, I was a mistress. I wasn't his girlfriend. I was a mistress. And I, it, it made me feel sick. I'm a very strong woman. I'm a very intuitive woman. And when things don't feel right or smell right, I question it. All right, we've got to take a break. Coming up, Yovani says she believed she was the only woman in her partner's life for over eight years. We'll be right back. When the Tiger Woods scandal happened, that's when it hit me that I was mistress. And never in eight and a half years did I ever feel led or made to feel like I was a mistress. I was led to believe that I was his partner, that I was his soulmate. Well, that was Giovanni talking about her shock in realizing that her partner of eight years had been cheating on her and, in fact, was still married. Now, this is the first time Yovani's speaking out about her story. Would you put these billboards up again today? Absolutely not. Um, I immediately, within hours of the billboards going up in New York City, I felt extremely regretful, mostly because of what it was doing to Charles professionally. I never in a million years thought that anyone would notice the billboards because it's a picture of Charles and a picture of me. I mean, I, we, I drive on the highway every day. I'm sure I pass at least 50 billboards. I can't tell you what billboards are up on Highway 101 or, or the 10. OK, you got a guy that's the head of a 70,000 employee company. Right. And somebody puts a billboard with a scandalous backstory up in anywhere on the globe, and you didn't think the media was going to think there's a story here. Well, honestly, he and I were public, so I kind of felt that, I guess, because I didn't factor in the 70,000 employees, I figured that they knew that I was his girlfriend. So they would, they would just say, oh, uh, Charles and Yovani. And then they would go to the website. And the website I actually created for his 50th birthday that year, and it, all it was was a website, it's an electronic photo album. So there were photos from each year we were dating. It, there was nothing salacious about the website. It was extremely benign. And when I th first came up with the idea to do the billboards, all of my friends were against it. They just said, why, that's crazy, don't do it. And I said, yeah, you're right. And th once the Tiger Woods thing happened, um, I called Clear Channel and said, what, is, what does somebody have to do to put up a billboard? So, I mean, it was not, I didn't give it enough thought. So when you asked, would I do it again? No. But you're kind of transcending all of that because instead of trying to get smaller uh, in the World Wide Web and, and everybody's consciousness, you're seeking to get larger with your memoir, your documentary. You just want to get larger with the full story. I'm not trying to get larger. If no one reads the docu if no one reads the book, no one watches the documentary, it's okay. What I want is for my nieces and my nephews and my re the rest of my relatives to continue to look up to me and to continue to admire me and not have in the back of your mind or back of their minds, how did Yovani not know that this was going on? Right. We know Yovani, she's smarter than that. All right. All right, we got to take a break. Next, we're going to talk about what you can do if you don't like what people are saying about you on the Internet. Is there any hope? Can you clean this stuff up? We're going to meet a man who says, yeah, actually, you can. We'll be right back. Well, today I've been talking to women who say their reputations have been ruined by news headlines and the Internet. Now, Michael Furtick is here, and he founded Reputation.com and says people have the right to control and protect their online reputation and privacy. But, Michael, it takes some effort. It takes some doing, right? 
The thing to do is to take control of the definition of what, of what the internet thinks is true about you. How do you do that? First, it's very easy to buy a website for yourself. And you might be, in your case, drphil.com, or someone else's case, firstname, lastname.com, and publish a very simple bio of yourself that defines who you are in your eyes. And number two, do the same thing. Twitter.com slash first name, not last name. Not Twitter.com slash funny girl Porsche, but first name, last name. Why? Because that shows up high in Google. The last thing I want to be very, very specific about is that social media privacy settings don't work. And I want to make sure that people understand that they're, whatever they publish or it's published about them can and will leak out there on the world. Okay. Thank you so much for talking about that. And those three points you had, we're going to put on the internet Great. as well. But that's a good idea to get a perfect match tag on a website that comes up so people at least get your side of whatever exactly. is going on out there. Uh, I hope you join our Facebook page and share your opinions. Also, continue to let me know what you think on the message boards. We do look at that, and a lot of our guests come from the message board because we do follow-up, and we get on there and see that you felt strongly about it one way or the other, or you thought I was a complete moron, or whatever. <laughs> uh, then we bring you here so you can tell me that to my face. <laughs> Thanks for being here. So long. Dr. Phil. The man with all the answers is here, Steve Harvey. We're talking relationships. Is the sizzle gone? Oh, everything's gone. <laughs> From a guy's point of view. So many women have a misunderstanding of how men are. The questions women ask. You think men are trainable? He's not trainable. Uh -uh. I'm trainable. Yes. Don't you think? Yes, yeah, you've come a long way. The feelings men hide. I moved in with her. I need a place to stay. Is she the one? So far. This is the best guest you've ever had. He works part-time, he loves video games, and if you nag at him, he just drives away. What are men thinking? The surprising answers begin right now. The biggest mistake women have all the time is... This is going to be a changing day in your life. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. It matters to you. That's what I want to talk about. Are you ready to move? Take it. Let's do it. If you are a woman dying to know what men really think, I have got a special guest that's going to tell you how it is, even more than I say how it is. Comedian Steve Harvey is back, and he's got all the man answers to your questions. Now, most recently, he's been making us laugh as the host of Family Feud. Take a look at this. Name something that gets passed around. Chris. A joint. A joint. <laughs> yeah, I like this question oh. here. Name a household chore you'd love to see your wife do in the news. Mop the kitchen. You got him. Mop the kitchen. Name a kind of crack. Crackhead. <laughs> Name something a burglar would not want to see when he breaks into a house. Right. Naked grandma! Naked, huh? I don't want to see that either. All right, please welcome comedian, radio, TV host, and author of Straight Talk, No Chasers, Steve Harvey. sharp today. Thank you. We were up late last night. Oh, you could say, oh, we can say that? We could say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah we, had a, we had a dinner at Dr. Phil's house last night. I don't call him Dr. Phil anymore. I call him Philly. <laughs> <laughs> Got a new nickname. I saw him at his house. Really, probably shouldn't say this. One of the nicer homes I've been in. I can tell you that right <laughs> yeah. there. <laughs> I'm going have to get me a doctorate degree because you're making cash. <laughs> 
I'm sorry I brought it up now. Your wife did a beautiful job, though, man. Well, she, really she, she loves her man. home. Your wife is lovely. She's here. Marjorie's here today. She controls my every move, so. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're going to hear from her later, so I'd be careful what you say. You got me last time I was on the show. I wanted to tell you I didn't appreciate that, too, buddy. <laughs> yeah. You just had your way with me last time. It's okay. I might get you back a little bit today. Yeah, well, you might. But, hey, listen, I got I, I to gotta bring up something that, because Robin and I are so often targeted in the tabloids, and uh, I, you got to turn these last couple of weeks. I don't know if y'all saw it, but you know, you, you had an ex-wife that started saying a bunch of things about you that just absolutely simply were not true. Mm -hmm. She was saying that you left her penniless and destitute. You kept your mouth shut. You took the high road. And then a judge lifted the gag order and kind of blew the whistle on her. And when the court documents were opened up, you gave her three houses. You uh, only had three houses, right? Okay. Just every house I had. <laughs> you gave her all the houses you had. I was homeless. <laughs> yeah. She had some great lawyers because I paid for them. They were outstanding. <laughs> yeah. I can't tell you how impressed and proud I was in the way you handled all of that. You know, I still have a, a, a mission as a father. You know, I have three sons. I've always taught my sons to be respectful of their mother. And I can't let my son see me say something disparaging or disrespectful publicly about their mom. On the internet, you're allowed to say anything you want to say. And we were fortunate enough in that we had the resources and the, and the ways to get the truth out. They're even now attacking my dog. <laughs> but, but it's not enough about me. <laughs> They're attacking my dog. You know Maggie the dog. Yeah, I met Maggie while we were eating. <laughs> That's Maggie all grown up. I was really proud of the way you handled everything, and uh, I, I hope you put that behind you and move on. And I am proud of your new book. Now, you're kind of getting in my lane here. I marked a, a few questions a few? Uh, that, I, that, <laughs> that, that I had in the book here that, that we want to go over. But this is his new book, Straight Talk, No Chaser. All I do is give women... You know, a peek inside the gentleman's club, a peek inside the locker room, a peek inside what we talk about with each other. I just let women really understand how we are because so many women have just a misunderstanding of how men are. You keep thinking we're like you, and if your man was like you, y'all couldn't even make it, not for a day, you know. <laughs> and there is not one thing in here that's politically correct. There's not one. <laughs> there, 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 there's not one thing in here that, that you wrote because somebody expected you to. But what I like about it is you don't present yourself as an expert. What you say is, I'm going to be your friend at the factory. I'm going to tell you what men really think, what they really talk about. Men are wired different. So this is how we look at the deal. I don't, I don't care if you, you don't like it. He doesn't talk to me the way I talk to him. He can't. He, he can't. He's a guy. Who, who, who wants to be married to a guy just... You're so, you know, Phil, you know, I was, you know, honey, honey, you was, so, hey, man, what are you doing? You don't want to roll over in the morning and look at you, right? You don't want to roll over and be married to somebody that looks like you, thinks like you, talks like you, smells like you. All right, we're going to answer some questions today. Our first guest is a young, beautiful model and actress who says she cannot find a good man that's ready to commit. Take a look. Fellow Steve, I'd really like to find a nice guy to settle down with, but I have a history of bad dating decisions. My most recent relationship came to a crashing halt when I found that he was not only married, but had four kids. I grew up in a very conservative religious household where I was highly encouraged to marry the first guy I was with. That ended abruptly two years later when my unemployed, confused husband suggested that we have an open marriage. My relationship before that was very committed. He said he loved me. But when I mentioned the N-word, he ran for the hills and married the first girl he saw. So, Dr. Phil and Steve, how can I tell if a man is decent and really ready to commit? Not just saying what he thinks I want to hear. Okay, so obviously, beautiful girl, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would just say. Thank you. <laughs> what do you think's wrong? What's your theory? Men just look at me as a conquest. Like, once they catch me, then they don't want me anymore. 
Yeah. And they're like, okay, on to the next. Can I say this to you? We don't care about what your visions and dreams are and hopes mm -hmm. for tomorrow. We walk up to you because we see something across the room that we want. Now, we yeah. got to go over here and figure out what it's going to take to get. What's, what I, what I mm -hmm. think might be happening to you is you, you get to a point with a guy, and even when a guy gets you, you, you let your standards mm -hmm. go. Once you let a guy get away with not doing what he did in the beginning, mm -hmm. we're going to take advantage of that. you got to keep yeah. your standards up here. And how do I do that? D they're your standards. They're yours. You don't mm -hmm. have to get off of that. You know, we we got to have you. Uh -huh. you, you, can, you understand that part? Yeah. Phil don't do well without her. <laughs> I, I don't do well without her. you got to look and say what it was that you have to own. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's that you picked poorly that you just didn't have a high enough standard when you picked, or when you got in the relationship, you let them take you for granted and get too easy. If you do that autopsy on your last relationship, then you can say, okay, I now have a to-do list of what I'm going to do in the future. I'm going to do this differently in the future. I'm going to keep this guy guessing every step of the way. He's not ever going to take me for granted. And seriously, you're just not playing your cards right. Guys respond to two things, pain and consequences. Uh -huh. Those are the two things that gets a guy's attention, pain and consequences. Mm -hmm. If a guy has no fear of anything happening to him, that's I'm going to get out of this unscathed and cool, I'm going to do it. If there are no consequences behind my actions, mm -hmm. fine, I'm going to do it. A guy operates on those two things. Now, I don't know what you call that at the school, but... <laughs> But that's what, that's, I'm just telling you how my buddies are. But you got to play where you're not desperate. You don't yeah. come across as like, I yeah. need a guy. Because you don't need a guy. You're fine mm -hmm. without a guy, but you want a guy. Yeah. But you can't, you really can't give them the opportunity to think, I'm in control here mm -hmm. every step of the way. Well, all right, next, what Steve Harvey says is the biggest mistake women make when trying to get men to do anything. We'll be right back. I feel like I have to nag Anton all the time to do something. You spend all your time playing video games. You're not going to win this conversation. A daughter's secret. Nobody knew the truth. And a mother's suspicion. When I mean, you found this picture on the I, cell phone. And I was in shock. A mother is not expecting to find something like that. And I started digging by myself. I retrieved a box out of the ground. And that's when I saw... Sorry. One of the most shocking confessions. I so desperate to see if what I was looking at was real. And it was. Ever revealed on Dr. Phil. 40 police officers, a crime scene unit at my house. Secrets gone wrong. I felt my life was over at that point. Find out the secret Monday. Well, we're talking about what men really think, and I'm talking about it with my good friend and comedian and author Steve Harvey. Now, his latest book is Straight Talk, No Chaser. The biggest mistake women have all the time is they find out the information too late. You find out he's married too late. You find out he's, he's something's wrong with him. He's really not working. He's really not a committed type guy. You can get this figured out in 90 days if you give yourself a chance. But once you commit yourself physically to a guy, you become emotionally involved and you try to force to make it work because I slept with the guy. And you end up dragging yourself through the mud with a relationship that you really need to get rid of. All right, but we did a poll about that. To really understand a man's intentions, Steve says women need to hold on to sex for 90 days. So we ask you if you thought it was reasonable to ask a man you're dating to wait 90 days before having sex, and here are the results. 84% of you said yes, it is reasonable to wait 90 days. 16% said no. What do you think about that? You know, I got a lot of flack from that chapter. That's, <laughs> I, that's the most flack I got. Women could not understand that. But I'm figuring like this. Look, if you're looking for a lifetime commitment, what's 90 days? You know, you're trying to have something real. Now, if you just want to have a fling, then knock yourself out. 
most guys, we don't want to take home to our mothers the Lucy Goosey babe. We don't, we're not taking you down off a pole in a strip club and taking you to our mama's house. That ain't what we looking for, man. All right, that's your point of view. Now, I want all of you men to go to DrPhil.com and tell me whether you would stick around for 90 days before having sex, okay? So go to the poll. I want to hear from the men. Would you wait 90 days? All right, next, Jennifer says that she's tired of constantly nagging her boyfriend to get him to do anything. Take a look. Jen, you got to see this. You got, oh. You going to do that tomorrow? It looks fun. My boyfriend and I are having a lot of communication issues. The dishes are still there. They're not. They're actually done by me. Anton and I have been together for about almost two years. Uh, we just recently moved in together. I feel like I have to nag Anton all the time to do something. That's how I spend his time. Playing video games. Infinite boost. Infinite boost. My avatar is sad. Anton and I bicker a lot about doing household chores. He slept until 7.30. Yeah, that's what people do, Jim. People sleep. You spend it's all your time game. playing video games. You're and not going to win this conversation. The house is usually a mess, and when it does get clean, it's because we choose to clean it together. So, can you clean something now? What do you mean, clean something? I do almost all the housework while Anton's playing video games for like three to five hours, and it just gets really frustrating. No, I do not spend too much time playing video games. Come on. How can you spend too much time having fun? Serious. Okay, Jen, what do you want? What, what do you want from him? I want more help from him. I mean, is this, is he the one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously, is he the one? I feel like he might be. Th this is who you're going to grow old with? Hope so. I don't want to be jumping from guy to guy. <laughs> yeah. Is she the one? So far. <laughs> we have we, we have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'm with you. I, I'm with you there. Um, <laughs> you know why we're distancing ourselves? <laughs> we're distancing ourselves because the women are getting ready to storm the stage. Okay, but no, seriously, your question is why can't you get him to do anything? How can you get him to do more? I'm going to answer the questions in reverse order. How can you get him to do more? You can't. And why can't you? He's 19. He is a child. 20. 20. You've turned 20 when? June 7th. I'm a Gemini. So you are... <laughs> hey, it's cool. Don't worry about it. I'm a Gemini. I got this. You'll be 21 in June. Yes. Okay. <laughs> do you have a... <laughs> I love this guy. Do you, do you have a job? Yes, I do. What do you do? I'm a part-time sales associate. Do you work a lot? I'm part-time. <laughs> and do you play a lot of video games? I enjoy video games, yes. Are, are you good at it? No. Most of the time. Yeah, what are you playing here? You're, you've got a steering wheel of some sort? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the Wii. We just got that, so I'm, I'm still in the beginner stages. I mean, as you can see, I don't really have a good turning radius. But I can drive a car fine. And having a good turning radius on Wii is important to a relationship. Are you worried about him being able to contribute and provide and, like, pay bills and buy a house and take care of babies and things that happen when people stay together and get married? Yeah, I'm definitely a little, a little worried. But You're a little worried about that? Still young. <laughs> so, male, male point of view here, Mr. Harvey. I mean, look, I got a chapter in the book called Dating by the Ages and what women should expect from men in their different periods. And this guy's not letting me down. Yeah. <laughs> If you read the book, I describe men in the 20s 
this is my guy. <laughs> I couldn't have picked a better guy. I mean, this guy's living the life. He works part-time. He loves video games. He cleans occasionally. I mean, he, he doesn't... And if you nag at him, he doesn't care. He just drives away <laughs> on the Wii game. This is great. But for, for you who wants more, you're expecting more from this guy, and he's not there yet. You know... I, I describe in the book how I try to tell women that when you're ready to settle down with a guy, a guy has got to capture three things. Who he is, what he does, and how much he's going to make. Those three things drive us. Who we are, what we do, and how much we make. This is unclear in any category. <laughs> we are right back. Tuesday on an all-new Dr. Phil. Her boyfriend is jealous of her best friend. I don't believe that I'm crossing any boundaries. Commit to this relationship or get out of it. But you don't go play footsie with this guy. That's Tuesday. Did you go to school? Yes, I did. Did you go to high school? Yes, I did. Did you graduate? Yes, I did. Are you going to college? I'm taking the semester off. <laughs> You can do what you want. <laughs> Did you decide to take the semester off when you got the Wii game for Christmas? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so how many semesters have you gone to college? I've gone to college for three semesters. Did you pass? No. Did you do your homework and No. No. You didn't do that. So you just <laughs> You just say I fell in love. She has most of the characteristics and the drive that I wish I could have. I moved in with her. I need a place to stay. <laughs> but I do, I do love her. You, you, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> this is the best guess you've ever had. <laughs> Are you at all concerned that this could turn into a parent-child relationship? Mm. A little now. bit. I mean, I feel like I'm cleaning all the time. I feel like moms clean all the time. I don't want to feel like a mom. <laughs> Jen says they bicker about household chores, who, who does what and who does more, right? Yeah. And you do more. I feel like I do more. Do you think she does? We do exactly the same. Do you think this is going to turn into a marriage? Currently, yes. <laughs> Do you have a job? Yes. Full time? Yep. He just, he just got a second job. He just got yeah. himself well, that's a second good. job. That's good. So you have a second job? Yes. I try not to, but I'm a slacker. We have two jobs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, is this where I expected myself to be? No. But is, I'm happy with her. And, yeah. I'm, and I'm happy where we are. I'm happy for her, most of all. I mean, she's, she's got a great career ahead of her, great future, and I hope to be part of it. W why do you say you're a slacker? I mean, look at her. <laughs> I feel like I'm just not enough. Well, maybe you should, like, man up and, and become uh, what you think she deserves. Uh, <laughs> Because you obviously, no, seriously, you obviously are very intelligent. And you obviously have a great personality, so it's just a matter of deciding that you, you just want to step up and be a full partner in the relationship, right? I, I pay half the rent, I, I do half the chores, I, I do half of everything, and she has a lot of you-do-this statements. It's really not equal. There are some things specific to manhood. There's just some things that come with this package. Women usually pick guys because they fill up voids and needs that they can't do. So if you're just doing the same thing, that's not going to work. You just got to do more. You, you got to, like Dr. Phil said, you got to man up, man. You got to go get off the grind. You got to get on the hop, man. You got to start making it happen. Y'all, you know, I man, y'all ain't going to make it like this. Yeah, you're awful young. Y'all need to keep it light, roll with it, and see what happens. Because it's neither one of you are ready yet to be thinking about something long term. 
-hmm. Marjorie and I, we have a 20-year-old son. He's in college right now. And this is him. Yeah. <laughs> this is him. And if a girl came to the house talking about, I'm going to move in with Steve Jr., I would go, hey, look, little girl, I don't know who your parents are, but go <clears> talk <throat> to him, because he's my son. And as much as I love him and think we've done a bang-up job of raising him, this ain't what you want right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If your son looks like him, he, he ain't your son. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. well, right, next. Why one man says he never listens to his wife. Did I read that right? <laughs> All right, we're back. Donna asked me to be a better listener, but I noticed that she's not the one mm -hmm. listening. And rip the carpet out. When she's gone after me, it sounds like a poor little cat with its tail stuck in the door. Blah, 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 blah. talking about what men really think with comedian and author Steve Harvey. Now, his latest book is Straight Talk, No Chaser. And what I love about this book is you're just given the man's point of view. Men think predominantly the same way on most subjects. Yeah. We just are that way because it's, it's, it's in our DNA. Well, and you think men are trainable? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are to... To the level that we can be trained. Well, I'm trainable. I think I'm trainable. Yes. Don't yes. you think? Yes, yes. You've come a long way, honey. A long <laughs> way. <laughs> a long way. <laughs> you hear that? I like that. You hear that? That's a nice shot there. Yeah. yeah. Right yeah. after Valentine's yeah, Day. Yeah, right too. after Valentine's Day. <laughs> way to keep it going, Philly. <laughs> Now, Donna says her husband, Rudy, still won't listen to her after years of marriage. Maybe he's not trainable. Take a look. We're going to refloor the bedroom. Mm. My wife, Donna, peppers me with questions and doesn't even let me answer the first one when she peppers me with five or six other questions. I would like to see Rudy doing more listening. Donna asked me to be a better listener, but I noticed that she's not the one listening. Donna expects me to fix everything around here, fix the cars, fix our relationship, fix everything. The greenhouse ready. When she's gone after me, sounds like a poor little cat with its tail stuck in the door. Blah, 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 blah. That's humor there now. Donna used to love my sense of humor. And now, no. You were hearing us talk about are men trainable? Do you have him in training? Not at all. He do, he doesn't. No, he's not trainable. Uh uh. <laughs> he is no. not trainable. No. Uh uh. <laughs> What's the biggest disconnect? Um, I think if we have uh, a problem that arises in the marriage, which everybody does, I want to sit down and talk about it, fix it, come to a compromise, and move on. And he doesn't. No. <laughs> okay. What does DJN stand for? Demanding, judgmental, and needy. Demanding, judgmental, and needy. And that's how you refer to her, DJN. Jokingly, yes. Jokingly. Yes. Yeah. Jokingly. She's not laughing. Not no, I know. She, she's not laughing. <laughs> no. So, Steve, what do you say to that? I mean, because... Help me out here. I have a chapter in the book called The Real N-Word. And it's nagging. And I want to tell you what makes men think you're nagging. It's two T's. It's tone and it's timing. You know, you, you want a guy to do what you want to do when you tell him to do it, and that may not even fit into his scheme of, 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 of what's happening right now. And then the tone. You know, if you're talking to the guy like he's a kid, you know, we're going to shut you out, man. We're just going to block it out because of your tone and your timing, and now you're nagging and we don't hear you. And then when you got something real to bring to the guy, he don't hear that either. So what do you think about what he's saying? I like it. <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling you would. What's the man cave? The man cave is where I do, uh, do a lot of uh, fishing pole repairs, and it's my sanctuary. It's one of my sanctuaries. Yeah, and you like to be in there by yourself, right? Yes. Okay, okay. We, we've got a little tape of the man cave. I have two man caves. Hey, and my man caves are my sanctuary. One man cave is the cave that you see right here, right now. All the things that I love to do. 
And my second man cave is in the garage. I have fishing gear, tools, and antiques. When I'm in my man cave and my wife comes in, I'm like a bobcat being backed into a corner. I'll come out and I'll let you know that this is not appropriate. What can she do? Give her something, you know, not a, not a criticism, but something with a verb in it that she can do that would cause you to engage more. Um, come in and say to me, you know, honey, uh, when you get a good time to come and help me, would you do that, please? And that just simply that mm. instead of demanding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If Robin came and said, hey, I really need you to come get this off the shelf for me or get it down, something like that. My thinking is she usually doesn't come get me till she needs it. Right. You want it when you want it, right? That's right. That's right. And it's very important. I wouldn't ask if it wasn't important. And so I need it. And if you don't come, then fine. I'll do it myself. And if I break something or, or drop it, then I'm sorry. I'll have to replace it. And they break something and drop it on purpose. Yeah. Oh, that's when you hit a door slam, and that's when you know, okay, she wanted this right now. We don't think and feel the way you think and feel. So if, if your currency is for us to connect at the same wavelength that you're on, that, that this to you is like a really big deal, and this was a message, this had a meaning, this had a gravity. Yes. And to us, it's like, not really, I didn't, that wasn't what was intended. It's hard to, to connect on that wavelength. I understand, because we can uh, take an evening where we can just have a rip-roaring, holler and fight. We get up the next morning, and he hands me my coffee and says, here's your coffee, dear. You go to bed, you're upset. But in the morning, what a guy thinks is, okay, we've had a full night's sleep. This should be over. <laughs> I'm going to bring some coffee. Here's my peace offering. I still love you. Sorry about the argument. Last. Yeah, that doesn't work for you at all. Mm -mm. In a guy's mind, though, we've been to bed. <laughs> this has got to be over. Eight hours I'm knocked out. New day, new new start. Let's go. We just, that's how we look at it, man. Listen, that's, so that cup of coffee is an olive branch, isn't it? This is a peace offering. Not necessarily. It's something I do every day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. No, yes, I it mean, is. aren't you trying to be, did, <laughs> aren't you trying to be nice? Of course I am. Something that would help, seriously, is if you could say at the end of it, if you have something that you need, it would be helpful if you would say that. Okay. I, I need something that would help me. Something I would need is A, B, or C. Okay. There are times I've gotten in trouble and I still don't know what I did. <laughs> you know, I still, I don't, I don't. Sometimes I do. I don't get, I get it. I, I, I know that I'm in trouble, but I don't know what it was. That's not true. What? 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 <laughs> what you, that is so not true. What is not true about that? I'm very, very clear. <laughs> you hear me. You're just playing dumb. I do not. Right. <laughs> Amen. No, sometimes we don't know, right? No, we really don't. Because you don't want to hurt her feelings, do you? Not at all. So if you knew what she needed, if you knew what was important to her, if you knew what her currency was, you would make efforts to, to try and, and fit that need, would, would you not? Of course. All right. Next, Steve Harvey's Bible on how to please a woman. We're consulting our wives on this when we're right back. Well, comedian and author Steve Harvey has written the Ten Commandments of Pleasing a Woman in his latest book, Straight Talk, No Chaser. Now, we're bringing in the experts for this one. Steve's wife, Marjorie, and my wife, you all know, Robin. So say hello. <laughs> what do you mean by commandments? I took a lighthearted approach, but thou shalt give her free time. Right. Thou shalt remember the small things, you know. Tell us a little about him. Watch out. What's a small thing? What's a small yeah. romantic thing uh, he does? I'm gonna, be, thing? I'm gonna be over in your house in a minute. <laughs> Just let you know. yeah. Well, he knows that I love flowers. Um, not leaving his plate 
on the table and food everywhere. And it's like, okay, sweetheart, just rake it in the trash. The trash is right there. Oh, so and you bought that up on TV? <laughs> See, because that's, that's the thing I don't, I don't really care to do. You know, excuse well, you me, I'm not trying to act like a big baller or nothing, but excuse me, housekeeper? Does he eat like a wolf or something? See, what do you, why is there See, food there all go. around? All right, number three, you say thou shalt consistently find new ways to say I love you. Run a bath water for it. You know, she loves taking a bath. Just run the bath water. Oh, that's so sweet. You know, <laughs> don't run her bath water. No, I mean, you, you gotta don't run your wife's bath no, water. I don't. I don't. No, you don't. This is crazy, man. You, Why are we up in here on your show? You don't even run your wife's bath water. No. This is embarrassing. <laughs> Number four, thou shalt chip in. I chip in. Tell me. You how. don't run the bath water. No, no, you don't chip in. Right, number five, thou shalt help with the kids. Those are all our kids, you know, and I, I do everything. I'm there for my kids. I, I do everything. You don't, you don't do anything. <laughs> you don't know what I do. I, I do, just too. Say, okay, name something. I right do, here. I do all kinds of things with the kids. I'm constantly on the phone with Jordan and, and working true, with him. True, on, he's always there for the kids. On to his help music. me with the kids, no. But he's wow. always there for the children. They're now, wow. I will say he helps me with our granddaughter. It's so, he's so sweet. I can say, hold Avery while I run and get a bottle. Or hold it. Oh, oh she's, she's so crazy. cute. So he's he's getting better even now with the grandchild. Well, she's more comfortable with me now. Yeah, she is. She you loves know, him. Because used to, I'd him. pick her up. She oh, <laughs> And now she just climbs like yeah. a spider monkey. Yeah. And well, here's yeah. the next one. Yeah. Uh, thou shalt embrace the art of foreplay. Now that's why we're really on the show now, see. Now we're talking. Because uh, I consider myself a surgeon. Oh. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm always finding ways to, to make it, um, uh, you know, ready time. See, I stay ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I don't need nothing. If you come in the bathroom and go, I'm good to go. <laughs> I've said women need a reason, men need a place. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Thou shalt respect her schedule. Yeah, Thank does you. she respect your schedule? She does. She doesn't respect mine. She just books stuff. You'll buy tickets to a play like a musical. I hate musicals. I hate them. I don't want to sit there and I'm watching what's happening and all of a sudden this dude just bust out singing. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there going, and you don't even know the song. And it's, I hate it. And so yeah, she books that kind of stuff and I have That's to go. That's foreplay. That's foreplay. See? They're going to the play. Yeah. That's the reason. You just need a place, remember? <laughs> <laughs> number eight, thou shalt send her roses just because. Fine, number nine, well, thou well. shalt remember the golden rule. And number ten is huge. Thou shalt always take her side. Don't ever, <laughs> ever yes. side with someone else against your wife. Right. I don't care that what so she right. does. You can never side with someone else. And you've got to remember the golden rule. And the golden rule is you can be happy or you can be right. That's your choice in marriage. We'll be right back. Dr. Phil and Steve, after 25 years of marriage, after the children are gone, the humdrum and distance of everyday life, how do couples keep the sex hot? If they seriously spice it up in the bedroom, it seems impossible after so many years. Please help. All right, well, that was one of just many questions we received after polling our audience to find out what they were having trouble with. The man with all the answers is here, Steve Harvey. He's just saying, look... I'm your friend at the factory. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what guys really think because nobody else will tell them, right? No. Nobody else will tell them because it's not very flattering sometimes. Right. All mm -hmm. right, Suzanne and Mark. That was your question, right? Yes. About keeping it going in the marriage. Is the sizzle gone? Oh, everything's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to hear it, Mark. No, <laughs> no, why, why, why aren't you after her? Why aren't you seducing her? Well, I, I, it would, uh, I'd like to be able to go to the sleep at the same time. We, we're on different schedules. She's a night owl and I work, but 
You know what? You're right. I just need to... <laughs> Thank Dr. you. Dr. Thank Phil, you. Dr. you're right. I just need to seduce this woman. <laughs> I don't think he finds me attractive anymore, and that hurts me. And you know what I mean? Like that, for women... Do you well, find her attractive? Absolutely. Thank Look you. at her. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> You know, so often people start being mothers and fathers and they stop being friends and lovers. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. You've got to decide you are going to seduce this woman. We've been married 34 years, right? Yes, 34 years, almost 35. And she's a hot tamale. You, 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 just have to, you just have to decide you do it. You behave your way to success. And it, it's like I've said, it, it, whether it's basketball, baseball, golf, or sex, practice, practice, practice. And That's true. We're going to get some practice in. <laughs> yeah, all right. So give her a kiss so we at least know you mean it. All right. What, what do you think about what I'm saying? I mean, you're exactly right, but it's the guy. The guy's got to make a move, man. You got to make a move here. You got to get yourself some baby oil. You got to get it. I mean, get to and just start squirting and rubbing and I'm washing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That feels good. But it's not just him. It's her, too. Yeah, it's to absolutely. To seduce him and, and keep him interested. I mean, right. Philip just turned 60 years old, and I surprised him with a music video, which I thought was very creative and very sweet Whoa. of me. So, yeah, I mean, come on, oh, you always have to have video. Whoa, whoa, video. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah. yeah Dr. You know. Phil and them got a sex tape out. All right. All right. All right. She did do a music video, and it was hot. All right, we got to take a break, and we're going to finish up here. Now, a couple of things. You're going to be able to see Steve perform live at Radio City Music Hall on March 12th, right? You're going to be there March 12th. Radio, that's pretty good. That's, that's, I'm there. Radio City Music Hall. Now, Steve and Kirk Franklin kick off their joint comedy gospel tour in Atlanta on March 19th. And Steve Harvey's gala at Cipriana's in New York is on April 4th. Now, who are you honoring this year? Honoring the CEO of Ford Motor Company, Alan Malali. We're honoring Tyler Perry and uh, Chris and uh, Malak Rock, Chris Rock and his wife. They oh, do a great. lot of great philanthropic work, so it'll be a great event. You know, We're going to have all of these dates as well as information on the Steve Harvey Foundation at drphil.com so you can find everything we just mentioned right there. We'll be right back. I want to thank all of my guests for being here today. Thanks for all the questions. Steve, Marjorie, thank you guys for being thank here. You. I really appreciate that. And everyone in the audience is going home with a copy of Steve Harvey's latest book. Great talk. No chaser. Now, if you want to send me your comments, email me at drphil.com or visit my blog, Turning Point, at blog.drphil.com, or you can send me a tweet on Twitter. Thanks for being here. So long. <laughs>